I'd like to welcome everybody to this morning's uh, Atlantic Herring Management Board. It is a beautiful day. The sun is out. It's going to be almost 70. It is a great day for a parade. <laughs> yeah, and here we are. Yes. Exactly. So let's wrap this up so we can get back to Boston and join the parade. <sighs> So I want to thank everybody for being here this morning. Um, the first order of business is uh, to actually, we don't, I don't believe we have anybody signed up for public comment. Uh, is there anybody that planned on speaking uh, on any items that are not on the agenda? Seeing none. Let's go right into item number two, which is board consent uh, approval of the agenda. Are, is everybody else set on the agenda? Any additions? Any new business? Seeing none. Uh, approval of the proceedings from the October 2018 meeting. Has everybody had an opportunity to look at the minutes? I'm assuming everybody has. Is there any objections to those minutes? Seeing, seeing no objections, they are uh, accepted uh, as written. I went a little bit out of order. Item number four is consider approval of the draft addendum two for public comment, and Megan is going to uh, is going to go over that document with some mu mood music. Um. <laughs> I asked for that. <laughs> That's true. All right. So today I'm going to go through uh, Herring draft addendum two. Just a reminder on our timeline, the board initiated this at annual meeting, um, and the PDT developed this document between November and January of this year. Today, the board is going to review this document and consider approving it for public comment. If it is approved, our public comment period would be March through April of this year, and the board would return in May for uh, reviewing that public comment and potentially taking final action. So this addendum was largely in response to results of the 2018 stock assessment, which showed reduced levels of recruitment over the last five years. And while in the terminal year of that assessment, the stock was not overfished and overfishing was not occurring, there were still serious concerns about the future health of this stock. And as a result, the board initiated this addendum to consider strengthening the existing spawning protections in Area 1A. Um, in the motion for the addendum, the board recommended that the PDT consider measures including the GSI 30 trigger value and the closure period length. So just to review our existing spawning program, uh, right now we're focused on area 1A, and there are three closures. We have the Mass New Hampshire closure in green, the Western Main closure in yellow, and the Eastern Main closure in blue. We use samples to forecast the timing of spawning by modeling the relationship between GSI and date. And GSI, as a reminder, is a calculation of the gonad mass to total body mass, and it's a tool that we use to measure herring maturity. The initiation of a spawning closure is determined by a trigger value, so that when GSI is projected to exceed the trigger value, a spawning closure is implemented. And if there are insufficient samples, we use default closure dates. Spawning closures last for four weeks, but they can be extended by two weeks if samples indicate a significant number of spawning herring. So before I get into a bit more details about the spawning program and TC analysis, I did want to preview the issues that are in this document. So there are three issues that this document considers. The first is the trigger value. So what is the trigger value that we use to initiate a closure? The second is the closure length. So how long do we close for? And the third is the reclosure protocol. So do we need to reclose? And if so, what is the threshold we use to determine when that happens? And I wanted to preview these issues for you because they are all connected. So depending on what trigger value you choose, that may influence how long you have to close for. And depending on how long you close for, that may determine whether you need to reclose and at what trigger. So kind of the overall message of this slide is it's important to think holistically about this addendum and the options in it when the board reviews the document. 
So talking a little more specifically about the trigger value, again, that is the value that we use to uh, see when GSI exceeds it and then implement a spawning closure. Generally, a higher trigger value closes the fishery later and closer to spawning, while a lower trigger value closes the fishery earlier to provide protection to maturing fish. Um, our current trigger value is 25, and TC analysis showed that that results in spawning closures that start within a few days of when the population reaches 25% spawning. And so the question that's prompted here is, is initiating a closure when 25% of the population is spawning still appropriate? Um, the TC did note that lowering the trigger value would reduce fishery spawning interactions, so you will see options in this document with lower trigger values. However, it's important to highlight that when we use a lower trigger value, we would implement a closure earlier, so you may need a longer closure period to provide protection throughout the spawning season. So again, this is getting at how these options are related. If you lower the trigger value, you really need a longer season. Um, also, lowering the trigger value and then having an early, earlier closure may shorten the time available to collect spawning samples. And then to talk a little bit about the closure length and our reclosure protocol. So I think the question here is, is the current four-week closure sufficient? And the, through the TC's analysis, they found that in the past three years, the Mass New Hampshire spawning season has lasted four weeks, 2.3 weeks, and 4.9 weeks. Um, but they noted that there was much greater confidence in the longer seasons due to a higher number of samples in those years. And so the TC concluded that that four-week closure would likely result in frequent use of a reclosure protocol. Um, they noted that longer initial closures would increase protection during spawning and could simplify the protocol by removing the need for a reclosure. So you'll see in this document there are options for longer spawning closures. Um, but it's also important to note that a longer closure may increase the chance of multiple areas being closed at once. All right, so now we'll go into the management issues and alternatives. So our first issue, again, is the trigger value. And we have four options here. Option A is going to be our status quo, so it's a trigger value of 25. And again, that is closing um, the fishery when approximately 25% of the population is spawning. And on the right, you can see the default closure dates that are associated with that trigger value. Option B, we are still using a trigger value of 25, so again, we're still going to close when approximately 25% of the population is spawning, but with additional years of data, the TC was able to update those default closure dates, and you'll see it's three days earlier for Western Maine and Massachusetts, New Hampshire. So the only change between A and B is the default closure dates. Option C is lowering the trigger value to 23. So that would close the fishery when approximately 20% of the population is spawning. And you can see by looking at the default closure dates, they are earlier than the ones that we have at the top of the screen. And then option D is a lower trigger value of 22. So that would close the fishery when approximately 15% of the population is spawning. And again, with the default closure dates, you can see they're earlier and earlier the further down you go on the slide. So issue two is the closure length, so how long are we going to close for? Option A is status quo, so a four-week initial closure. And then options B, C, and D all are all extensions on that, so a five-week closure, a six-week closure, and an eight-week closure. And on a future slide, I'm going to show how the trigger values and the closure lengths are related. Um, but I did want to note for option D, that eight-week initial closure, the PDT included that because it may be long enough that we don't need a reclosure protocol for any of the trigger values in this document. And then number three is our reclosure protocol. So there are two options here. Option A is we keep a reclosure protocol such that the spawning closure can be extended for two additional weeks. And then option B is that there's no reclosure protocol. So we don't, uh, there's no option to reclose for two additional weeks. Under option A, there are sub-options, um, and that's related to the threshold at which we would reclose. And hopefully my coloring of the percentages is a reminder to two slides before, 
um, and that those percentages look familiar. So option A is status quo. So that is closing or defining our threshold as when 25% or more mature herring are found in that sample. Um, and that is related to the trigger value of 25. Suboption two is a 20%. Um, so again, that threshold is at the 20% or more mature herring, and that's related to a trigger value of 23. And then suboption three is 15% or more mature herring, and that's related to the trigger value of 22. So again, all of these options are related to one another, and they go back to what trigger value you choose. And then this is the final slide here. This is table two in the addendum. And if there's one table to look at, I really recommend that it's this one. So this one shows how the different management options are connected. So as an example, if we take a trigger value of 23, so that would close when approximately 20% of the population is spawning. And we can see what the average spawning season lengths are, as well as the range of spawning season lengths. So we have an average of 4.3 weeks, but we have seen one as long as 5.7 weeks. So this would suggest that when the board subsequently chooses a closure length, you might want to consider a longer closure length for that trigger value than what you have now, because um, 4.3 weeks and 5.7 weeks is certainly longer than the four weeks we have now. So hopefully that shows how all the options are connected. And I will take any questions. Ray Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Megan, can you go back to that slide on reclosures? My question is, are the vessels that are actually participating in the fishery landing and those are the herring that are checked, they take a sample of 100 or 200 fish and check for spawn, or are the small boat vessels still doing the spawn check, you know, running out there and grabbing samples and dissecting right on board, or how is that done? Thank you. I'm going to pass that to Renee, who's our TC chair. So in the past, reclosure samples have come from a variety of places and a variety of fisheries. They have been fisheries related, but they also could be fisheries independent as far as the reclosure is concerned. Does that answer your question, Ray? It's been small boats and big boats. I mean, it's the whiting fishery has been a place where we've taken samples, spawning samples, when there's a closure in 1A. Um, to see if a reclosure is necessary, but we've also taken samples once the fisheries open back up off of the purse et etc. Yes, thank you. Uh, I know in Megan's presentation she talked that a couple of years they didn't really have enough samples. I think it was in that 2.3 to 5.9 range. So what is the minimum number of samples do we need? So for the initial reclosure, there's a three sample requirement to not use the default date. So to project for the closure using GSI 30 protocol. And then for the reclosure, I believe it's just one sample is needed to trigger that reclosure. Thank you. Any additional questions for Megan? Seeing none. Um, we have before us the draft of Denim with no additional uh, comments or questions for Megan, is there any interest in modification uh, of the draft addendum or adding to the draft addendum? Seeing none, I think a motion would be in order if, uh, if the board is considering advancing this to public comment. Doug Grout. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move to approve uh, this addendum for public comment today. We have a motion on the table, a second, second by Ray Kane. Any additional questions or, or comments, Doug, or the seconder? Mr. Pierce. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, after we vote on the addendum, are you going to be entertaining a motion for a preferred alternative uh, to be brought to hearing, or would you? Uh, like that motion to be made prior to adopting the, the addendum for a public comment? Um, 
I think it's at the pleasure of the board, uh, Dr. Pierce. I have I have no preference either way. Um, if, uh, if if you have some thoughts on that, I think we could probably take that up after the uh, after we advance this. Any additional questions or comments? Seeing none, is there any objections? Seeing none, the motion carries without objection. Dr. Pierce, do you have a? Yeah, I'll offer up a suggested preferred set of alternatives. And Megan can correct me if I'm uh, out of bounds or confusing the way in which these are laid out. Uh, but I'm referencing Table 4, summary of the options under consideration in this action. With the trigger value being issue one, the closure length being issue two, and the reclosure being issue number three. So I would, uh, in light of the fact that we're looking at right now, as best we can judge, uh, four years in a row of historical low recruitment. Uh, Megan noted that in her presentation, circling in red, those low years of recruitment. Um, in light of the fact that we may end up with uh, National Marine Fishery Service decision to go with the council recommended uh, ACL for 2019 and beyond. Uh, I would I would make a motion that we adopt as a preferred alternative within the addendum trigger value option D. That's a trigger of 22. Closure length option D, which is uh, the eight week closure length, and. For reclosure, option B, the no reclosure protocol. So that's my motion, Mr. Chairman, for a preferred alternative uh, in the addendum. We have a motion on the table. Is there a second? There is no second to your motion. The motion dies without a second. Is there any other interest uh, from the board in putting a preferred alternative forward? Seeing none, we will uh, advance the document to public hearing without a preferred alternative. So that will take us to uh, item number five on the agenda, uh, which is the advisory panel report from Jeff Kalin. Terry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we move on to the next agenda item, uh, just a question from the council as to uh, when and how many public hearings are going to be uh, scheduled. Um, the council is not likely to have major issues, but would like to reserve the opportunity to comment. Um, is, let me ask the, uh, the, the jurisdiction states uh, what their interest is in holding public comments. Can I see a show of hands on who, I mean, uh, public hearings. Can I see a show of hands. Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Any states to the south of Massachusetts interested in public in a public hearing? Seeing none. So, uh, Megan, if you could work with those states on the uh, on the process on the uh, on the timing and uh, whether we'll need more than one. Um, does that answer your question, Terry? Thank you very much for bringing that forward. Tony. Tony. Terry, are you asking us to have it overlap with a council meeting, the public comment period? Um, thanks for the question, Tony. Not necessarily. There is a hearing committee meeting uh, being scheduled either late late March or April, so um, be an opportunity for the for the hearing uh, committee with our new uh, commission mem member to to have some discussion and hopefully pr uh, provide comments if if the committee so uh, wants to forward them through the council. Council meetings mid April. Uh, thank, thank you, Terry. I'm sure uh, Richie White, our newest committee, the newest council committee m member, will be glad to offer comment. <laughs> uh, so, uh, if, if there's no other comments, I'll move on to item number five, which is the advisory panel report from uh, the AP chair, Jeff Kalin. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, members of the board. I'm Jeff Kalin with Lunds Fisheries. I'm the AP chair. I was going to let Megan uh, run with this, but um, but she's asked me to do it. Um, the other thing I'll say, uh, there also is a, a federal AP, uh, Herring AP meeting, too, at the same time as that committee meeting, so there could be an opportunity for that AP to review this. I don't know if there'll be an AP meeting on, the, on this uh, 
addendum that we just approved or not. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I appreciate the opportunity for um, the AP to have met um, in, uh, on, on January 3rd. Um, the postponed motion that was considered is in three places. It's uh, on the meeting overview. Um, it's in the uh, specification, the January 11th memo, which is our report, and you'll see it in a minute on the advisory panel report here, too. On the first slide, I won't bother reading that. I think everybody knows um, why this meeting was held. Uh, so um, at the, the next slide, it says that uh, we did meet by conference call. The members of the AP are listed here. And I also know that uh, Commissioner Kane was on the phone uh, with us and Deirdre Bulky, who's the uh, New England Council's FMP coordinator, also listened in. So uh, the staff reviewed the existing quota period options in Amendment 3 and the postponed motion from October 2019, and then the quota periods that were selected by the board uh, for 2019. Um, Three AP members uh, did not support the motion, uh, they, uh, stating that uh, the board already has flexibility in setting the Area 1A quota periods, which has resulted in decreased access for midwater trawls in 2019. Board overstepping its reach in the management of a federal species was a concern. Uh, already enough uh, flexibility in Amendment 3. Um, additional regulations would be burdensome on the industry. Uh, no clear reason why this action is being considered, given the fishery can meet its goals under Amendment 3. A new addendum would complicate management of the species, increasing the regulatory burden on the fishermen and ultimately decrease flexibility in the fishery. Uh, three AP members, next slide, um, did support the motion, although they commented their support was weak. Uh, the comments ranged from uh, supporting additional flexibility in Area 1A, particularly when facing low quotas, because the fishery shouldn't be locked into a single management regime. It's important herring are caught when demand is highest. Another comment that uh, they supported the concept of flexibility, but would like to see data on herring catches to understand impacts on the various gear types uh, during the period of the fishery. And uh, there was some support for the motion, stating it would be stronger if there was a clear explanation as to why the action is being considered, and uh, also looking for data to analyze relative to landings, um, data from multiple bait species. I think that AP member was beginning to consider the need for projections on Menhaden productivity, given the fact that the herring productivity is going to be very low in the following years. So in the next slide, uh, one AP motion member wasn't in favor of additional regulations, but did recommend a quota period where 80% is allocated June to September and 20 between October and December, a uh, specific recommendation. Um, I think the only one we had. And one AP member didn't feel the data necessary to make a recommendation was available, but did note the importance of spreading herring landings throughout the year. Another member abstained from saying whether he supported the motion but commented that Atlantic herring is a federal fishery with federal permit holders who could be negatively impacted by the motion. And then, um, so that gives you an idea of what people thought of the motion uh, in the AP, and then we did get into comments on the 2019 quota period. Um, I believe uh, the board made a decision on this um, at, the, uh, at the annual meeting. Several AP members expressed concern about that decision um, to use bi-monthly quota periods in the 2019 fishery and uh, concerned the decision was made without landings data, so the impact of the changes wasn't evaluated. And there was a statement that uh, members of the AP would have liked an opportunity for AP input. That, that's come and gone, obviously. Um, Access to the fishery by midwater trawls was negatively impacted by that decision, and the Massachusetts lobster fleet, um, it was stated by an AP member, relies on bait caught by uh, the trawlers in the fall, so changes to the quota periods have broader impacts than may have been considered. Uh, under the bimonthly approach, the fishery would, could close uh, every other month, which could create 
chaos, and the uh, 18 and 19 quota periods are reflected uh, on the slide. And I think that is what we uh, went through. Mr. Chairman, thanks to Megan for helping me put together the report, and I'm happy to answer any questions the board might have. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that very thorough report. Sounds like you guys had a great discussion. Is there any uh, any questions for Mr. Kalin? Um, we'll start off with Dr. Pierce. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, right at the end of your presentation, you highlighted uh, one AP member commenting that the Massachusetts lobster fleet relies on bait caught by midwater trawlers in the fall months. So changes to the quarter periods have broader impacts on other fisheries. Uh, at the meeting, was there any um, any uh, discussion of herring being caught on George's Bank being adequate enough to account for what might not be available with a shifting quota in Area 1A seasonally? In other words, would that would that offshore fishery for sea herring uh, meet, meet the needs of the mass lobster fleet, uh, assuming that was discussed at the advisory meeting? Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Well, I think the comment was really r relative to the 1A, um, the splitting of the 1A quota. Didn't really get into whether the Georgia's fishery would be available to to um, uh, provide bait uh, or not. Um, I think it's, I don't think anybody really understands what happened to the herring. Um, maybe they're in Canada. That's where the Calinus went. I don't really know. So we're out looking. I know the fleet is out looking now in Area 2 and Area 3. Uh, for fish, it's not a great time to go to th Area 3, but you can sneak out there if the weather is good and people are trying to, to look for herring and, and uh, mackerel right now, so who knows, David. Um, that didn't specifically come up, though. We didn't get into Georgia's productivity in the AP meeting. Well, that's it for the AP report. So, of course, I, I don't want to get over that edge. You know, so I don't want to be an advocate. Uh, Justin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So it seemed like a, a theme in some of the AP member comments was that they wanted to see more data, more information about herring catches and, and certain other topics in order to have a more informed opinion about the potential impacts of greater flexibility. So my question is, if if the board did decide today to take up the postponed motion and, and approve it and initiate an addendum, would there be an opportunity for the PDT and the AP to have some back and forth and kind of, you know, so the, the PDT could get a little bit of information about what, ty what types of uh, information the advisory panel members would like to see in the addendum document? Well, that's a great question, and I think if the board approved moving ahead with the motion and the addendum uh, and asked the PDT to do that, I'm sure that could be done. And, and I think the, the, the AP would probably appreciate that. It would give you a little better idea of what the impacts are, are, would be on the various fleets involved. Any additional questions for, for Mr. Kalin? Seeing none, I think that is that conversation is a good segue into item number six, which is consider the postponed motion from the October 2018 meeting. I won't read the entire motion, but uh, it would have initiated an addendum, if, if passed, would initiate an addendum which considers providing the Atlantic Herring Board greater flexibility to set annual quota period specifications for the 1A fishery. Um, Richie, you got your hand up? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is my motion uh, originally, um, and after uh, talking to a no number of board members um, and also uh, discussions with Megan about trying to uh, better define uh, what I was trying to accomplish, um, <clears throat> I have the sense now that let's let uh, this lower quota uh, run through the system this coming year and then see uh, <clears throat> how that unfolds and if it will be necessary to uh, implement uh, more flexibility, uh, which I still kind of feel we'll need, but exactly what that kind of flexibility should be, I'm, I'm uncertain. So <clears throat> uh, I guess my sense is to um, 
you know, let this uh, sit for a year and let's come back to it uh, next year after we've seen uh, what we do with an extremely low quota. So process wise, Richie, um, the motion belongs to the to the board. Is this something that you would like to make a motion on in regards to postponement? Um, I would as long as there's no other discussion. I didn't want to immediately do that if someone else wanted to discuss it. Is there any uh, w with on that note, is there any additional comments in regard to uh, Mr. White's suggestion? Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate Richie rethinking his uh, original motion. Um, we don't even know what the specs are going to be for this year. The difference between National Marine Fisheries Service and the New England Council is a pretty substantial difference in year one and year two. So we don't really even know what we're dealing with yet. Um, so, I, so I appreciate the the forethought in not dealing with this. I, I just think we should just take this and, and vote it up or down um, with the maker of the motion not supporting his own motion at this time. I think it would be cleaner if we just voted it up or down and then revisit it as opposed to tabling it to some time. We don't even know what that's going to be. So we can, we, we certainly can, we can go in both directions, a, pay, a motion to to table indefinitely, could, you could let it die on the table or cleaner just to, just to, to kill it outright. Um, I'll, I'll take one more question for Mr. Stockwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, guess my question is, and I do appreciate the tenor of the ongoing discussion, is what exactly does greater flexibility mean? Um, as we continue our collaboration between the council and the commission process, their additional measures could effectively shut out some of the segments of the federal fisheries in complicated raising issues with MSA and national standard guidelines. I, I think the go-slow approach is the better uh, and more prudent at this point, particularly given the, you know, Eric's comments about the, the uh, soon-to-be uh, extremely low specifications for the next two years. Yeah, thanks for that, Terry. I think based on the, the Richie's comments, I, I think uh, he, the idea that we've even defined flexibility is, is, is not clear. So um, is, there any, is there any interest in moving this addendum forward from around the table? Seeing none, um, I, I'll look to Mr. White for, uh, for a motion, since it is his motion, uh, to determine the path forward. So um, is the correct motion to postpone indefinitely? Is that the table indefinitely? So that, that's what I will move on this motion. So we have a motion on the, uh, on the floor to table indefinitely. Yeah. So the motion on the floor is to table indefinitely, which would allow the motion to actually just die on the table if it, if it wasn't taken back up at a later date. Um, we have a second by Mr. Kane. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor uh, by Mr. White, seconded by Mr. Kane, which is moved to table indefinitely. We have any, uh, any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, the motion carries. Um, this brings us to item number seven on the agenda, which is to set the sub-ACL specifications for the 2019 fishing year. And unless somebody runs through the door uh, in the next 10 seconds, um, I, I, would, uh, I would say we don't have that. Um, uh, Allison, would you like to just, uh, would you, uh, would, can I put you on the spot to just update uh, the board on what you know, what you told me earlier? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've touched base with folks back in my office early this morning, and um, the final rule is will not file today and become public. So I think we're still uh, very hopeful that it will file and publish sometime this week. So, um, you know, knock on wood, there can be a, a discussion um, maybe later in, in the week or as the chairman sees fit um, to consider what, the what is in the final rule. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Allison, for that update. I think there are there are a couple paths forward here. Um, one would be to um, hold off on any decisions and table till uh, we, till the policy board to address this uh, at the end of the week. Um, with hopes that we would have new numbers, and then if we did not have numbers by then, um, likely conduct just an email vote on the specifications to accept them, uh, have the commission accept them. Uh, Mr. Grau. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to move to postpone final action on Atlantic Herring specifications until the policy board on Thursday if no fisheries provides the final rule. Got a motion on the table, seconded by Mr. Train. Any additional comments from the maker? Um, she's typing that up. Yeah. We'll give her a second to get that up on the board. So, a motion is moved to postpone. Final action on the Atlantic Herring specifications until the policy board on Thursday, if no fisheries provides the final rule. Uh, it was a motion by Mr. Grout, seconded by Mr. Train. Any uh, questions or comments on the motion? Adam. So just process-wise, I'm trying to understand, are we as a board essentially giving the policy board the authority to take action on this by virtue of this motion and does that then say that for any spec setting to any board that the policy board could supersede that decision moving forward I'm just trying to understand what authority we're ceding to the policy board in this action. I'm not opposed to the concept of delaying a decision, understand the importance of the final rule, but I think it's, we should be clear what this board may be ceding. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Adam. I'll turn it over to the executive director to comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Adam, that's a great question. And essentially, the short answer is yes. The, the Herring Board is, is you know, delegating authority to the policy board to make the final uh, specs. But I, I don't, I, I think the precedence is something that makes me a little less concerned in that, you know, we're, de we're, we're ended up in this spot because we had this lengthy federal shutdown and that we had sort of not operating under normal timelines and circumstances. So, you know, the, the specs would have been available for this board, you know, a number of weeks ago and everything would have worked out easily. But I think, I think it, we're, you know, this, this action is being considered because of the unique situation here. I don't, I don't think it will apply across the board for all other specifications down the road necessarily. Mr. Grout. Just a follow-up for clarification, this motion applies to one issue, this particular issue. It's not seceding our authority to the policy board for any other issue. It's just because of this unique situation that has happened due to the shutdown, we're, uh, I'm hoping that we can postpone and maybe uh, make our work more efficient by actually doing our work here as opposed to having to do it by a, uh, 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 a email vote. Yeah, thank you for that, Doug. Um, Adam, does that satisfy your curiosity? Again, I think it's just important that we have clear on the record what we're doing here so we know what we can do on Thursday and what we might do on similar situations in the future. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for that, Adam. I, th I think uh, the comments by Mr. Beal and Mr. Grout certainly make it clear that this is really a uh, unique situation caused by the federal shutdown. Um, and I'll hold additional comments in regard to the federal shutdown uh, until the hospitality suite uh, later this evening. Um, so um, with, with that, we have a motion on the board. Are any other questions in regard to the motion? Seeing none, I'll read it into the record. Oh, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this specific to 1A or is this for the whole fishery? It's, it's for the, the whole fishery, so it's the sub-ACLs for the different management areas. You know, only because it just, in the bullet points it references 1A, it doesn't say anything about 2 and 3, so I just was, I appreciate that.
So, okay, you all sat here. Okay. Um, any additional questions? Seeing none, I'll read into the record the motion. Move to postpone final action on Atlantic Caring specifications until the policy board on third, uh, until policy board on Thursday, if no officiary provides the final rule. Motion by Mr. Grout, seconded by Mr. Train. Uh, is there any opposition to this motion? Seeing no opposition, the motion carries. Thank you very much. This will move us, uh, Dr. Pierce. Yeah, just a quick point. Uh, let's assume for a moment that the National Marine Fisheries Service stands with its initial call, which was not to go with the New England Council's decision about what the, the ACL should be. Um, the Council went with a lower number. The NOAA has indicated, at least earlier on in the preliminary discussions in public published uh, material, that they're going to go with a higher number. So it will be a bit, of a, a bit of an interesting situation that if indeed we find out that they're going with the higher number, then I'm assuming the policy board would support that higher number. Therefore, ASMFC supports a higher number than the New England Council. It just, just creates a strange and, and uh, uh, opposite point of view that, that I wouldn't support, but we'd have no option but to do so except to <laughs> be stubborn about it and, and create complications by going with a lower number, that is the New England Council's number. Just wanted to highlight that. Uh, I'm hopeful that the, the, the uh, New England Council's position after uh, further consideration by, by NOAA that they'll, they'll go with what New England said was the appropriate uh, set, of, uh, set of numbers. Thank you for that. Uh, Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. I, I would like to point out that the National Marine Fisheries Service number in year one is substantially higher than the New England Council's. In year two, it is substantially lower. I think the number is 12,000 tons. I mean, so it's a it's a double-edged sword. New England's is more of a, a average isn't the right word, but it's more of a more of an average. Uh, National Marine Fisheries Service is substantially higher and substantially lower, which is a, a little problematic for me. So I, I don't know how that's going to affect our decision. I guess we've got to see what the final rule is, but um, that's my one cent. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I'm sure this will, um, both of those comments I think will highlight that some additional conversations will happen at the policy board via, instead of a strict rubber stamp. Um, okay, no, if there's no additional comments, seeing none, we'll move on to item number eight, which is update uh, on draft addendum three and the New England Fisheries Management Council 2019 priorities. Megan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so this is just an update and a reminder that at annual meeting, this board did initiate uh, addendum three, which is to consider spawning protections for area three. Um, and also at annual meeting, this board voted to send a letter to the New England Council asking that the council add spawning protections in Georgia's bank to their 2019 priorities. Um, so as an update to that letter, at their December meeting, the council did add a priority to consider spawning, protect, or spawning closures in Georgia's bank for 2019. So that was added to their priority list. Um, and given this action, I think at a staff level, the hope is to work cooperatively to identify what data is available for this action and to explore potential paths forward to consider spawning protections in Georgia's bank. Thanks for that quick update, Megan Ritchie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Megan and, and uh, then possibly Terry, um, what is the best case scenario timeline by which the council could have uh, spawning protection in place? Um, I can't have a, I don't have an exact answer for you, but in talking with council staff, my impression is that their work on this would likely start, uh, or they're going to first focus on 2020, 2021 specifications and then work on this Georgia's bank protection. So that is their plan for the year. Um, I don't have a date for when they would take a, an action on it or, or implement it. Follow up. Thank you. Um, then I guess a question for Terry would be um, um, if, the, if the council decides to go forward with an action, uh, how long might that take? Um, 
my concern being that <clears throat> we could have uh, substantial fishing on spawn fish for at least two years, and I'm not sure that um, um, <clears throat> is the that that kind of timing is uh, what we need to protect herring uh, at, at this point. Mr. Stockwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's not if the council is going to proceed with this work plan, it's when. Um, as Megan uh, reported, the council did add this as a 2019 work priority, but uh, the council's uh, current plan is to focus on the 2020-2021 specs first. You know, we'll, we'll, this this body is about to vote on the 2019 specs. Uh, as most everyone knows, there's going to be another stock assessment in 2020. So we need the council needs to put forward a second year plan. Um, I a short answer to you is it depends. Once we get the white papers, how complicated do, do the two bodies want to make this? If if um, the commission and the council want to make it a very complicated spawn enclosure. It's, it's going to take longer if, if the, the two bodies can agree upon something uh, sooner than later that's more simplified. Um, I would project it would uh, it would go out in the latter part of 2020. Thank you, Terry. Um, follow, uh, additional follow up, Mr. Chairman. If I, I sure, may, go ahead. thank you, appreciate your uh, indulgence. Um, <clears throat> yeah. This, this time schedule uh, really concerns me with the state uh, that we find ourselves with herring. And, you know, it may be that making or doing everything we can to have a good year class as soon as possible may make the difference to restoring this stock in a timely manner. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm certainly not looking for this body to take things on that the council can do. We got plenty of work ahead of us, and I'm not looking for additional work. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, we can act quickly and nimbly. And so I just throw out an idea. Would it make any sense uh, <clears throat> for us to try to implement something interim so that we're not we're not doing the council's work, but can we protect some spawning, some spawn herring in the interim faster while this work's being done? And I believe we have the ability to uh, protect spawn herring from a landing standpoint, not a fishing standpoint. Um, so does it make any sense for us to try to have something in place for uh, the 2020 season um, could even do it quickly for the end of 2019 season that would restrict uh, landing of spawn herring from area three. So I just kind of throw that out as a question and see what, it, what other people think. Thanks, Richie. Um, I understand where you're going with this, and I certainly would like to hear um, comments from the board. Um, I, I would also say I think the protections in 19, 20, and 21 are going to be based on the incredibly low quotas that we'll be fishing on. So based on that, my, my feeling is that while I think it would be important to ensure that we get something developed jointly between both bodies that because of the low quotas, I feel like we've got time to do that um, and going through the process. I would hate to get into a situation where we're, um, you know, we, we moved in the direction of turning this into a board to ensure we had continuity with the council and the council with the commission. And I think we need to give that process, I personally believe we need to give that process time to work out. And I think the low quotas over the next couple of years will do that. With that said, is there any additional questions or comments? Dr. Pierce. Yeah, I, I agree with the chair's perspective. In addition, uh, I'm waiting for the discussion document that has been referenced in our reading materials. Um, 
that discussion document is in progress, uh, I understand. In addition, as noted in our material for this meeting, the plan development team has also begun investigating available data on Georgia's bank spawning outside of state collected samples. So the PDT still has work to do. The discussion document still needs to be brought before us. As indicated, this is more complicated uh, than it might seem at first. Um, I certainly support protection of, uh, of Georgia's bank spawn herring. I always have. Uh, but 2019 is impractical. Now, if we find out that the council, for whatever reason, the council of which I am part, uh, is unable to do anything for 2020, then that puts more of a burden on us, that is this board, to consider action that would be, as you indicated, Richie, a bit of kind of an interim action. But by then we'd have uh, the discussion document, by then we'd have a lot more information to use to, uh, as a basis for doing something in 2020. Uh, I'm confident that the council will move this forward relatively quickly in light of the status of the stock and of course the overall ACL. So I hear what you're saying. I think 2019 uh, really would not work, but uh, I think 2020 is uh, ripe for further ASMC discussions on what to do. Mr. Stockwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your concerns and comments. Um, they essentially echo the position I was ready to, to advocate for. I would like to add that in addition to the extremely low quotas, uh, the likely implementation of the 12-mile buffer, which will uh, add further protection uh, south of the Cape. Um, the question I have um, and it might, uh, is, uh, what is the Commission's plan for the research money that was allocated, uh, and how could this inform our collaborative process in the next year? I don't believe we've made final decisions on the research money, but I'll pass it to Bob. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're correct. We haven't made final plans, but the way I envision this is that, you know, the working group, the, the joint council commission and, and technical folks that are working on the white paper or discussion document, whatever we're calling it, I think that's all part of that discussion. You know, what data is available, what data is still needed, and once we determine what data is still needed, um, they can, you know, decide what the best way to, to use that money. And, and the good news is we don't have to spend that money in the next you know, six or eight months. We've got about two years to spend that, so we've got plenty of time to, to use that money as wisely as possible, but it's all part of the same preliminary discussion that's happening now, is the way I see it anyway. Thanks, Bob. Is that satisfactory, Terry? I, I, I'd put one more item on the table uh, as well. Um, ACCSP um, dollars that have been funding um, monitoring in regards to herring, um, there's talk about tightening up and reallocating some of those dollars, and I know the research set-aside dollars that are, are going to be much less that are funding the sampling in the Commonwealth um, will be lower. So we do have some additional challenges when it comes to sampling, if, if in fact we get to a point where we need to collect samples from spawning uh, with the low quotas. So, um, Allie, sorry, I didn't, uh, I should have been looking farther down the table. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and I appreciate your comments uh, as well as uh, Mr. Stockwell's, and um, we'd be supportive of, you know, these two bodies working together to collaborate on this issue going forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And, and to Mr. Uh, Dr. Pierce's tenor, um, we, we cooperate till we can't cooperate anymore. Is that where you were going with that, Dr. Pierce? <laughs> build, build, build the wall. Build the wall. <laughs> We, 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 I don't think I'll go there, Jeff. Uh, so uh, any additional comments on, uh, on this item? Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. The discussion we're having here is about spawning closures on Georgia's bank. Is that exclusive of the Nantucket Shoals spawning area? And if so, is it just because there's not enough available information to even think about spawning closures on Nantucket Shoals? Um, so the... Council priority, and Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, was focused on Georgia's bank. The commission addendum was area three. Um, so there is a, a bit of a difference there that we will have to reconcile between uh, the two bodies as we start to work on this document. Um, but we do have a, a lack of data on Nantucket Shoals. That is true. Dr. Pierce. Yeah, that's, uh, I hadn't thought about that, but it's true. Um, but I suspect that 
when we get deeper into discussions about protection of spawning on George's Bank, the link between Nantucket Shoals and George's Bank will become quite obvious. As a matter of fact, the perspective, the scientific perspective, the U.S. perspective is that George's Bank rebuilt after it had collapsed in the 1970s and the early 80s. It rebuilt because of spawning on Nantucket Shoals that seeded the George's Bank area. That's the, that's the prevailing scientific opinion. So there's a linkage there that, um, that has to be respected, and I suspect that once our discussion document is, uh, is completed and once we have more discussions you know, with the uh, council staff, um, they'll, the connection will be obvious, and there'll be no other option but to pursue um, an approach that would deal with uh, fishing in the Nantucket Shoals area right adjacent to George's Bank. I mean, they're, they're connected. Um, so that's, that's what I foresee. Thank you for that comment. Any additional comments? Seeing none. It, um, that was our last agenda item. Uh, uh, one more call, though, for any additional business to be brought up to the, uh, to the herring board. Seeing none, seeing none, uh, we, a motion would be in order to adjourn. I didn't hear one, but we've motion to adjourn is accepted. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.